Let's bow our heads before we, we go into the, the message. Father in heaven, you have a message here for us that comes from your word. And so I pray that we would each one be prepared to hear it. And yes, it's true that I'm, a, I'm an imperfect tool. We're also imperfect listeners. And so you need to do your miracles in us today. And we invite you to do that. And we thank you that you are willing to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the New Testament, Jesus told parables. You know why? Because parables made complex ideas easy to understand. Good illustrations. But did you ever think about the fact that, that Jesus didn't wait for the New Testament to have parables, to give parables? He gave parables in the Old Testament, too. For instance, as far back as Adam and Eve, when he gave Adam and Eve the, 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 the process that they were to go through to sacrifice a lamb after their sin, that was a parable for the plan of salvation that would help them understand what he was going to do for them. And if you didn't know it before, the entire system of the Old Testament sanctuary rituals was a, a living parable that God gave to Moses illustrating the plan of salvation. And so as the people participated in that parable, over time, they began to understand more and more of the way that God was dealing with their problem of sin. And that's the parable that we're going to be exploring today. So here's how it worked. The daily sanctuary services involved someone bringing a perfect lamb to the sanctuary. The person would place his hands on the lamb and confess his sin. And then he would kill the lamb. And the priest would take the the sin-contaminated blood, we're talking in symbols here, the sin-contaminated blood from the lamb, and he would sprinkle that blood, beginning with the altar outside, and he would sprinkle that blood into the sanctuary. Then the lamb would be sacrificed on the altar out in the courtyard, and the sinner would go home completely forgiven. The whole process was done every single day of the year. It was called the daily sacrifice. And that parable te taught not only them, but it also teaches us how salvation works. So let's take it apart a little bit and look at what the daily service was designed to teach us. First of all, the sinner brought a perfect lamb and confessed his sins over it. What does the lamb represent? Jesus, Isaiah 53, 7, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. What does confessing the sin over the lamb represent? It represents us bringing our sin to Jesus, asking for his forgiveness, and Jesus taking that sin upon himself, right? Isaiah 53, 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What does slaughtering the lamb and sacrificing it on the altar, what does that represent? Jesus dying, being sacrificed for our sins. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, right? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So let me ask you now a question you might not know. What did taking the blood into the sanctuary represent? You ever think about that part of it? It represented the sins of the people being taken into the sanctuary to await judgment. We need to pay close attention to what happens with the blood in the sanctuary. 
Symbolically, the sins were carried in the blood of the lamb into the sanctuary, which is God's dwelling place, right? It's his, it's his palace. It's his judgment hall. God tells us that eventually he will cast all of our sins into the bottom of the sea. But that comes after judgment. For the moment, our sins are kept in the sanctuary. Confessed sin enters the sanctuary in the blood of the Lamb. But unconfessed sin also ends up in the sanctuary because all sin ends up before the judgment seat of God. One way or the other, all sin comes before the judgment seat of God. Think of it like a courtroom because it is. A criminal can turn himself in to the court. Or a crime can be brought before the court by someone else, like the victim of the crime, for instance, can, can bring the case. And even if the criminal doesn't come to court himself, the court still has to deal with the crime because that is a place of judgment. That's where justice is done. So all of the sin ends up in the sanctuary before the judgment seat of God, and those sins get filed in one of two cabinets, symbolically speaking, of course. One cabinet is labeled confessed sins, and the other cabinet is labeled unconfessed sins. And every single person has a dossier in each of those cabinets. When we confess a sin, that sin is moved from the unconfessed files to the confessed files. That's kind of my own illustration. The Bible speaks of books instead of filing cabinets. Books. The daily service of the sanctuary illustrated how you could turn yourself into the court by bringing a lamb for sacrifice and confessing your sins. You were then allowed to return home guilt-free, because the judge said, essentially, thank you for coming to us. Thank you for confessing. I see your heart in this matter. Since you freely confessed your sin and are repentant, I have a solution for you. In the blood of the Lamb. You can go home now, and I will apply that solution to your case at the proper time. And God files your case in your folder in the confessed cases file. That's essentially what happened in the parable that was the daily service of the sanctuary. Now, many Christians recognize this process, but also many Christians stop at this point. Once Jesus died for our sins, Everything was accomplished, they reason. I mean, that was the end. After all, Jesus said from the cross, right? It is finished. But what was it that was finished? What was finished? If that was the end of the story, what happens to all the sin waiting judgment in the sanctuary? When Jesus said it is finished, he was announcing the fact that the, para the parable of the daily service was complete. The Lamb of God had been sacrificed. The solution that was needed to save mankind from the penalty of sin was now in place. That part was indeed finished. But the daily service didn't end the sanctuary parable. There's more. There needed to be more because the sins in the sanctuary needed to be dealt with. The judgment process still needed to happen. The solution that Jesus provided still needed to be applied to all of the cases. The job of the heavenly court is to deal with <clears throat> the sins. Each of the cases, so that in the end, justice is done. And only after justice has been served can these cases be completely and officially closed. Guess what it's called when books are opened and cases are looked at one by one and the judge makes decisions? It's called Judgment Day. Judgment 
day. So there was another part of the sanctuary service that happened not every day, but only once a year. Once a year on the day known as Yom Kippur. Have you ever heard that? Yom Kippur. It means, literally translated, Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. That was the symbolic day when the sin that had collected in all of those case files in the sanctuary over the course of the year were judged so that the sanctuary could be cleansed of the mess of sin that was being stored there. This happened every year, not because Judgment Day happened every year, but because it was a yearly parable representing what would happen at the end of time when the sanctuary would be cleansed. All of this background puts Daniel 8.14 into a whole new light. And he said unto me, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We're going to come back to this first, but first let's take a, a, a closer look at the Day of Atonement. If, have you ever Googled Day of Atonement? Kind of an interesting. If you Google the terms, I just did it yesterday to check again. If you Google the terms Day of Atonement and Judgment together, you come up with thousands of writings, not only Jewish, but also Christian and also Islamic, that connect the Day of Atonement with end time judgment. And there's good reason that they do. In the same way that we explore the details of the daily service to understand how God teaches us about the God's solution to the sin problem, now we need to look at the details of the Day of Atonement and learn how God teaches us, uh, teaches us about the application of the solution to judgment in judgment. God gave us the daily sacrifice as our simple guide to forgiveness. God gave us the Day of Atonement as our simple guide to Judgment Day. So we need to study both of them. They're all part of the same parable. A quick summary of what happened on the Day of Atonement is that the high priest and the people all prepared themselves for this most solemn of days, making sure that their sins had been confessed, that their hearts were right with God. The high priest himself went through rigorous purification and preparation because he was to enter the most holy place into the very presence of God that day, which was a dangerous thing to do. And both the high priest and the people knew it. On the Day of Atonement, the people of Israel would surround the sanctuary outside the courtyard, they would surround the sanctuary and they would spend the day humbling themselves, fasting and praying while the priest went about his work in the sanctuary. It was a serious time for them because everyone understood it was a time of judgment. <clears throat> Two goats were prepared for the Day of Atonement, one of which would be slaughtered at the beginning and then starting in the, mo in the most holy place, the priest would sprinkle the blood of the goat from the inside to the outside. This was the reverse of the blood going into the sanctuary during the daily sacrifice. So during the daily service, the blood went in, and on the day of judgment, it went back out. Follow the blood. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to it. After the priest finished the work, he exited the sanctuary and the live goat was brought forward. The high priest then confessed his sins, uh, or, or actually the sins of all of Israel, on the head of the goat. And then that goat was led out into the desert and abandoned there, where it would, of course, eventually die in the wilderness heat. So that's a, that's a quick walk through the yearly service, the Day of Atonement. Our next question then should be, when does the Day of Atonement happen? We already know that the daily sacrifice was completed when Jesus died on the cross. So when does the yearly part of the sacrifice or the yearly part of the parable happen for real, not just symbolically? And that question is answered in Daniel 8, 14. Until 2,300 days, 
then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So that verse describes when judgment will come. But Daniel, who received this vision, didn't even know when the 2300 days would begin. So it was impossible for him to calculate when judgment would arrive. And the angel told him, essentially, Daniel, you're going to have to deal with it. Seal it up. You're not going to know what this answer is. The secret will be unlocked just before Judgment Day arrives. And that's exactly what happened. A Baptist farmer in the early 1800s by the name of William Miller figured out that the 2300 days actually represented 2300 years. And there he calculated, from there, he calculated the timeline that led up to the cleansing of the sanctuary. And he showed from the Bible that the sanctuary would be cleansed in 1844. His arguments were so compelling that by conservative estimates, at least half of the population of the United States was convinced. Some say more. It took the U.S. by storm. Unfortunately for Miller, for Miller, even though he was correct about the date, he misunderstood what cleansing of the sanctuary meant. Miller thought that that meant Jesus would return. He didn't understand that this was when God would begin to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven of the sins that were awaiting judgment. Obviously, Jesus didn't come. And the reason is, is because the Day of Atonement was not about the second coming, never was. It was about judgment to take place before the second coming. It makes sense that this time of judgment must happen before the return of Jesus, because according to the parable, when he comes, it signals that this long process of judging has been finished. There is judgment when Jesus comes, but that is executive judgment. That's when God executes all of the decisions that have been made in the heavenly courts earlier. It's the same way in our judgment courts today. It works exactly the same way. The process of, of investigation, of examination, of cross-examination, all of that takes a lot of time to get through. When the judge finally strikes the, the gavel and pronounces final judgment, that's the culmination of a lot of work. God works the same way because the process of justice is something that must be done carefully, intentionally, and transparently. All of this means that judgment is happening right now in heaven. 178 years ago today, October 22, 1844, this process started happening in heaven. The heavenly courts began going through our case files and judging them, as is described in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. Thousands upon thousands attended him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. If judgment is in process in heaven right now, then the parable that we find in this day of atonement is critical for us to understand today because it reveals how God will finally deal with sin once and for all. And it also reveals how we should be participating in the process. So let's take it apart a little bit. First, in, the preparation, in preparation for the Day of Atonement, Israel spent several days in, uh, before Judgment Day preparing for it. They searched their hearts, they confessed their sins, and they did their best to reconcile all of their relationships with each other. Also, there were several things they were told to do before they came to God. Uh, for one, 
They were to drink no strong drink, nothing fermented. So their minds would be in peak condition during this time. Also, as part of humbling themselves, they were to remove all of their jewelry and anything else that might attract attention to themselves. Even the high priest didn't wear his fancy clothes with all of the bright colors and the precious stones. He wore a plain white linen ephod, a robe. The Day of Atonement was a day for stripping away anything that might smack of pride or distract from what was happening in the sanctuary. Since the Day of Atonement is a parable to teach us, what does all this preparation tell us about our attitude toward life today if we're living in this time of judgment? Shouldn't we live in the realization that our day in heaven's court could come up at any moment? Shouldn't we live in the realization or the knowledge? Shouldn't that affect the way that we act and the way that we look even? We would prepare for our day in court before an earthly judge, wouldn't we? Dress up, suit and tie, right? <laughs> Imagine a felon who had confessed his sin was repentant, and was released on parole. And now he's actually up for a full pardon. Do you think he gets ready for that day at the last minute? No way. How does he dress? Does he deck himself out in gang paraphernalia? Does he walk loudly into the courtroom with his nose in the air and an arrogant strut? Does he come drunk? Of course not. He's going to put on his best behavior before the judge. Who wouldn't? We prepare for a day of judgment on earth because we know it's serious business. Our lives are on the line. How much more for the heavenly judge? On the day of atonement, the high priest brought a bull and two goats to the sanctuary with him. The bull he sacrificed his for his own sin as he did usually, but the goats were unusual. This didn't happen in the daily sacrifice at all. Two goats were unusual. One goat belonged to God. One goat belonged to Azazel. Now, the name Azazel is usually relegated to the margin of your Bibles in favor of the term scapegoat. But literally, it was called the goat that belongs to Azazel. We're not even positive where the term Azazel came from. Uh, Jewish tradition has it that it was the name of a demon. These two goats were key figures in the Day of Atonement. The goat that belonged to the Lord was sacrificed for the sins of the people, just like all of the other animals during the year. That death, the blood from, from that goat and from all the sheep that had been uh, in the, during the year, all symbolized the covering of the sins in the confessed cases file. That is the solution that God promised that he would apply on Judgment Day if we confess our sins. The blood of Jesus covers your sin. So on Judgment Day, you and I are declared innocent if we let Jesus take our place. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so even during judgment, the blood of Jesus is central. Even during judgment, the blood of Jesus is central. Nothing good happens in the salvation process without the blood of Jesus. So the one goat was sacrificed. The other goat doesn't come into play until the very end, after judgment has closed for the most part, which is significant. We'll get there, but let's finish with these, these symbols. On the Day of Atonement, no one was allowed inside the sanctuary while the high priest was performing the rituals. So the people actually had no idea what was happening inside the sanctuary and where the priest was in the process at any given moment. They knew when the Day of Atonement started, but all they could do during the time that the priest was doing his work of judgment was wait and pray, which they did fervently until the priest came out of the sanctuary. In the same way, we know when judgment started. It started in 1844, but we have no idea where Jesus, our high priest and judge, is in the process of his work. However, 
we will know when he's done. Because when he exits the sanctuary, so to speak, judgment will be complete, probation will be closed, and he will return to earth along with the verdicts of judgment. At that time, he will separate the people of earth into two groups, those who have been pardoned by the blood of Jesus and, who they, and will live, and those who refuse the blood of Jesus and will die for their own sins. On the Day of Atonement, sin is put where it belongs. Important concept here. On the Day of Atonement, sin is put where it belongs. During the daily service, sin was brought into the sanctuary. During the cleansing of the sanctuary of the Day of Atonement, the high priest reversed that by sprinkling the blood from the inside back outside. This represented the fact that all of the criminal cases that had been brought into the sanctuary had now finally been judged. But not all sin is judged the same, because remember, some has been confessed, and some has been forgiven, and some has not. When each case is judged, it's separated and goes to the right place for atonement so that justice will be done. You see, this was God's dilemma from the beginning. The law says that the wages of sin is death. So God had only one option when someone sinned. They had to die. But God loves us so much that he wanted another option. He wanted another option. He wanted a solution that would allow us to live. But God is not above the law. So he had to find a solution that would satisfy the law without a breach of justice. And he found that solution in the death of Jesus. The law allowed for a substitute to die for the sinner so long as the substitute was God himself. After Jesus gave his life for us, now God had two options. Sinners could either, either die themselves for their sins if they chose that option, or they could choose for Jesus to be their substitute. So when each case of sin is judged, the sin will be paid for either by the death of Jesus or the sin will be paid for by the death of the sinner himself. Either way, justice is done. And that brings us to the second goat on the Day of Atonement. After all of the other Day of Atonement cleansing rituals were complete, it was time for the final act. This was the end of judgment. The priest took the goat in waiting, the goat that belongs to Azazel, and he symbolically placed the sins of Israel on its head. And then a man led the goat out into the wilderness and abandoned it, where, of course, it eventually died. The priest exiting the sanctuary represents Jesus' second coming after he finishes his priestly work of judgment in heaven. The second coming will mean that judgment is complete. But the priest exiting the sanctuary still has something to do with this goat that belongs to Azazel. So what is all that about? What does this goat that belongs to Azazel represent? The history of the name Azazel has been lost to us. No one is certain of its origins. Therefore, people discuss and wonder what this should represent. Some actually believe that this goat is another symbol of Jesus, but that doesn't really line up with all of the data in the parable. First of all, this goat is never sacrificed. Second, the man who led the goat into the wilderness and abandoned it, when he got back, he had to wash himself. That was a, a signal that he had been handling an impure thing. Third, this goat didn't come into the picture until judgment was finished, after the blood of Jesus had been applied. When Jesus returns and separates everyone by who will live and who will die, who is left for God to deal with? How about the one that started it all? Satan himself. Everything about this goat points to the idea that it represents Satan, the last one to face judgment. 
What this parable of the two goats illustrates is what will happen at the end of the great controversy. The first act of the great controversy centered on Jesus and Satan. Then all the rest of us got dragged into it, where we've been for the last 6,000, however many years it might have been. But after the second coming, all of us have been dealt with. And we are removed from the picture because each of us has, been, by that time, been pronounced either guilty or pardoned. Now, in the final act of the great controversy, like the first act where it all began, once again, everything centers on Jesus and Satan. Because now, in the end, all of the sins of the world fall on these two. All of the confessed sins fell on Jesus, and he died because of it. And who must bear the unconfessed sins? The ones who committed the sins, right? Including Satan, who must bear all of the sins that he was responsible for. How many of the sins out there is Satan responsible for? In some way, all of them, because he started it. And he will have to pay for those with his own life, just like all the rest of us do if we don't confess our sins and let Jesus take it for us. He will be joined in the lake of fire by all of the wicked and the disloyal who have chosen to atone for their own sin as well. And at that point, all sin, both forgiven and unforgiven, will be atoned for, and the entire problem of sin will be finally and forever gone. Do you understand how the sanctuary parable guides us in how God is dealing with the problem of sin? And do you understand how the Day of Atonement ritual, understanding that is critical to what God is doing on our behalf at this moment and understanding our part in that process? We have a part to play as we Pay attention to what is happening in the sanctuary. And we live in that reality. As we study these ancient rituals, we're not just doing some theoretical exercise. This stuff is happening today. It affects us right now. Time is nearly up. Judgment is in process. And it will end sooner rather than later. If you've invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then you have already been forgiven. Your case will still come up before the court, but Jesus is there covering you. That one is forgiven. That's what the Day of Atonement is all about. It's our simple guide to Judgment Day. It's worth studying.